You're very welcome back to our coverage of stage 20 of the Giro d'Italia from Cilandro to Trecime de Lavaredo. 211 kilometers uh, for the riders. Changes, uh, massive changes to the route profile of today's stage as a result of the uh, extraordinary weather that has uh, been uh, a part of this Giro d'Italia almost since the start and has been uh, affecting pretty much everything in the Dolomites and Alps. There's the scene at the uh, finish line at Trecime the Lavaredo. Everyone's in place and ready to uh, receive the riders. They're out on the road at the moment, as you saw. The uh, conditions for the riders are cold but clear at the moment, but uh, plenty of uh, snow on this final climb up to Trecime the Lavaredo. But the race organizer, Michele Acquaroni, says that uh, they'll definitely be able to ride up the hill. It might be different if they had to ride down the other side of it. Uh, four riders up front. Just a uh, quick, uh, just to let you know that we understand there were uh, all sorts of gremlins at the beginning of the uh, broadcast. To be honest, they've been mercifully, uh, mercifully few throughout this uh, Giro d'Italia. So uh, I think we might have had the wrong type of snow on the uh, commentary lines there for a little while. But uh, we're back and uh, ready to go. Um, alongside me is Sean Kelly, ready to survey the action throughout uh, this stage. And we've. We're gonna first stage really of this race that we've been able to watch almost all the action and it's great to see the full pattern of the race and get to get a sense of how it shapes and evolves the breakaway group has managed to uh, extricate itself from the peloton there's uh, four riders up front they've got an advantage of six minutes we're inside 150 kilometers to go and Merte of Androni, Pavel Brut of Katusha, Adam Hansen of Lotto and uh, Jens Morris of uh, Arica Green Edge are the four riders that have uh, leapt up the road, trying to make a name for themselves, trying to see what they can do about staying away all the way to the finish in uh, Trecime de Lavaredo. The peloton on the front is being controlled by Omega Pharma Quickstep. Interesting to see Uskal Tell up there as well. They uh, obviously perhaps feel that uh, Samuel Sanchez has a chance today. And uh, with Omega Pharma Quickstep up there, you can be sure that Mark Cavendish has... Uh, looked at the revised profile and perhaps believes that he can score some intermediate uh, points. We're heading through Bozen at the moment. It uh, was part of the original route and it uh, makes an alteration here. It goes left instead of going straight on. Misses out the uh, passes of Costa Longa, San Pellegrino and uh, the Chao. They've all been removed, those three. Paso Tre Croce remains along with the final climb to the finish at uh, Trecime de Lavaredo. Tre Croce and La uh, Lavaredo are actually more or less the same climb with just a sort of a little, tiny little descent in between. It's almost like a Telegraph and Galibier combination. Uh, but we do have two classified uh, mountain sprints at the top of uh, Tre Croce and obviously at the finish line in uh, de Lavaredo. And of course, uh, Trecime de Lavaredo is the Chima Coppi, the highest point of this year's race. As the control, the controls go on from Amiga Pharma Quickstep. Julian Vermont on the front and uh, working hard. Just to remind you, at DQ Sport is the Twitter handle. Please do join the conversation during the day. We've got uh, lots of action to survey, and of course, we've got lots of different topics to discuss from the uh, three weeks of racing. It's been an extraordinary Giro d'Italia, a dramatic one in so many ways. And uh, Sean, it really is a relief, I think, to one and all that at least we've got racing today. Yes, uh, it is a relief because uh, it was looking uh, real uh, risky and looking dangerous yesterday with the conditions. Uh, and as, as we have seen today, again, it's uh, snowing quite heavily at, uh, at Trecimi Lavedo. Um, it will be interesting to see it's not uh, staying on the road and that's going to be the good thing. I see we can see there it's you know melting very quickly when you touch uh, ground. So. Um, Hopefully that we will get the stage out of this and, and you know get all the way up this climb. But uh, again, we have still 147 kilometres to go. Things can change so quickly, and it's amazing in the valley here. You know, it's dry, good conditions. But when you go up to the altitude, of course, uh, as we've been seeing um, in the last number of days, uh, a lot of snow up there. But uh, good to have a day's racing. I suppose from the other point of view, it's. Uh, probably disappointing the last number of days because we had some fabulous stages uh, to, and fabulous climbs to go over but unfortunately the weather conditions put a stop to all of that but uh, you know that's uh, nothing nobody have control over the weather conditions so it's just two riders at the front a couple of riders have uh, are taking natural breaks so they're working their way back together again uh, Popovich is up there by the way it's not uh, Jens Morris uh, Jens Morris 
had bridged across to that move, uh, but they did a little bit more racing. We just picked up live pictures just before we came on air, so uh, thanks to uh, Peloton Watch who pointed that out. Uh, it's uh, Popovic of the uh, Radio Shack uh, squad, Jaroslav Popovic, that is up there and not Jens Morris. And the Peloton is lined out, big gap between them. Mehmeti, Popovic, Brut and Hansen. Uh, the last uh, time check we got was six minutes between them, but clearly the peloton is not minded to let that gap go out any further. The appearance of quick step on the front, uh, Sean, indicates that Mark Cavendish believes that he can, he can do something about uh, controlling his uh, points lead, perhaps extending it at the intermediate sprint points a bit later on. Well, I think, uh, you know, it's all to play for in the points competition, as it have been. Um, the last week already and um, here today we have two intermediate sprints and I think uh, you know looking at the uh, the change route uh, possible for Mark Cavendish to take the intermediate points and I think he you know is is worried because the advantage he has got over uh, Cat Evans you know it's a tiny advantage and uh, if Kevin if Evans takes some points today if he takes you know major points though then it could be difficult for Cavendish uh, tomorrow there's no guarantee at the stage tomorrow but it looks like Cavendish should be able to win the final stage but certainly they're controlling the situation at the moment okay we just heard the uh, gap has gone out to eight minutes and 16 seconds The riders are working their way to Trecime de Lavaredo, the highest point of the Giro d'Italia 2013. They've got 144 kilometers uh, still to ride. And this is the scene at the arrival. It's uh, blanketed in snow at the top of the uh, Lavaredo. The spectators still uh, smiling, smiling at the moment. Hope they're wrapped up nice and warm. It's been warm riding up the hill, but uh, it's a long time uh, to wait in uh, these kind of conditions. I tell you, very chilly indeed. But uh, riders out on the route, uh, some have come with short sleeves, pretty much everyone in shorts at the moment, so uh, contrast in clothing conditions. The uh, riders, uh, the four riders up front have a gap of 8 minutes and 16 seconds. That's uh, Jaro Armerti of the Androni Giocattoli Venezuela team, uh, Pavel Brut of Katusha. Adam Hansen of Lotto already has a stage win in the bag, and uh, Yaroslav Popovic of the uh, Radio Shack squad. Over eight minutes clear, and uh, going well indeed as the play peloton is paced by Omega Pharma Quick Step. It, the road rises pretty much all the way throughout the day, so it's going to be a slog for the riders, any riders that are struggling. Robert Hessink, of course, as we uh, told you at the top of the broadcast, is not in today's stage. He's gone home. He's not feeling well. It's all gone uh, spiraled downwards, really, in the third week. Didn't uh, work out as he would have hoped. The uh, Dutchman from the Blanco team will try and get himself uh, fit and right for uh, challenges later in the, uh, in the season. And, of course, at the top of the broadcast, much talk about the departure of Danilo De Luca. And he's slinked away as a result of his doping suspension. He was caught positive for an out-of-competition test in, uh, on the 29th of April. Uh, the uh, test was sent to the Cologne Laboratory that uh, previously uh, found the uh, Clembutrol in the sample submitted by uh, Alberto Contador after the 2010 Tour de France. And uh, that Cologne Laboratory has uh, revealed that 37-year-old Danilo De Luca is once again positive uh, for EPO. Produced a Sarah uh, EPO positive in 2009, was also involved in the oil for drugs scandal, served a uh, suspension then, and uh, repeatedly he's come back into the peloton and said, well, you know, I've learnt my lesson and I will, I will behave, but, uh, well, this is uh, surely three strikes in, you're out, Sean. It's, uh, as I said earlier on, it, it, the one good thing you can say about De Luca is that he's 37, so his career is, uh, is winding towards a close, and uh, he represents a past era. Yes, he, was, he represents the past year, and in the past, of course, you know, he was uh, positive, and uh, that was a different time, but, uh, you know, cycling uh, today and the, and the last number of years, you know, things have totally changed, and uh, you would think uh, those guys would learn, and, uh, 
you know, getting back into a team, first of all, you can't imagine, the, you know, they're telling everybody, OK, you know, that was in the past, that was my past, it's all over now, things have changed. And, you know, they just uh, promised the sun, moon and stars to the sponsors and to the team directors. Uh, but unfortunately, you have these, you know, crazy people who continue on doing it. And DeLuca, you know, um, when he was the, uh, the second time, you know, you would say, well, that was, you know, too much, one too much. The first time, okay, it was in an era when things were going on. We all know about, you know, in that time in cycling. But uh, you know, today it's uh, totally, uh, you know, totally crazy. And as his team um, director of sport, Eve Squint, has said, like he needs help. He's sick, and that is, you know, I think uh, that's what it is really. Because when a guy continues on doing it, um, you know, there's n there's no words that can explain why. Yeah, his uh, team director, Skinto, Lucas Skinto, said, I'm devastated. I never wanted to look at the team. We have built our group on the sacred values of cycling, and we made the mistake of complying with a request expressed many times by our main sponsor, who asked us to have faith in an athlete who was a dear friend of his. Unfortunately, this trust has been rewarded with a terrible mistake, which I still cannot comprehend. And uh, Vinny Fantini's main sponsor, referring to Valentino Scotti said uh, well what can I say I believed in this man and in the athlete and it's right that it should be me who takes the blame because I made a mistake I must ask forgiveness from the fans the team and other sponsors my partners and all the other cyclists who are racing in the Giro d'Italia fairly and honestly and all those young athletes will be shaken uh, by this news what's a shame is that he did actually animate the race he did affect the way that stages ran towards the end uh, luckily he didn't win a stage and uh, as I said he's, he wasn't a factor in the overall so uh, there was no implication in the manner in which the race was run at the front in terms of uh, in terms of the overall contenders. Speaking of overall contenders, uh, Vincenzo Nibli is uh, grinding his way towards the front. What's his thinking there? He's staying out of trouble, or does he want to go up and have a chat and uh, ask them uh, to go a bit faster or go a bit slower? Um, well, I think uh, the Moby style right there we can see. Um, He's not happy, and uh, it's uh, last stress. And uh, he seemed to be talking to the motorbike. It was too close to the riders in front, and giving them, you know, the um, the drafting, uh, pacing them a bit, and uh, just time to move on and keep it further ahead of the peloton. Yeah, and nearly just uh, staying to the fore, of course. He, the, as he has done throughout the race, the Astana team just ride in behind the uh, the group of riders that have taken up the chase, and then they're the next group. So they're getting the. Uh, decent amount of shelter but staying as far out of trouble as possible great weather conditions uh, in the region at the moment the way that river is flowing though snow melting and flying off the mountains and there's everyone's favorite motor motorbike they'll be supplying the drinks it's not that warm that they'll be uh, rushing for the bidons one question uh, Mark Fairclough asking, do you agree with Brian Smithy, Brian Smith, that uh, Vinnie Fantini should withdraw from the Giro, and that we need to start looking at lifetime bans for the dopers? So, should Vinnie Fantini have uh, stepped off the race, and should we be looking at lifetime bans for dopers? Well, I think lifetime bans certainly. Um, you have to um, look at. Um you know the situation as well. Um, you know nowadays we know uh, you know that the controls and I, I suppose the good thing as well. You know um, De Luca, he was taking the control and he was being followed and I think there was a lot of out of competition testing going on and uh, you know, it's uh, it's got him and taken him out of off competition. Um, Vinny Fantini out of the race. That's you know a, deb a debatable one because there's a lot of riders in there and I think you know they were. Uh, Believing that uh, De Luca was a changed man, he was a clean rider uh, for you know a very uh, checkered pass. But I think uh, we heard from Skinto, we heard from the team, the team uh, owner. Uh, you know there was uh, um, there was an understanding there, and um, there was a belief there that um, De Luca had changed. And uh, unfortunately, you know it's not the case. And uh, in, you know it's uh, it's it's too late now should Vin should Vinny Fantini come out of the race I don't think so because I you know there's a lot of riders in that team there who you know uh, were under the same belief as I and as all the followers was in Deluca we said you know now he has to be clean he cannot be going on uh, the past but uh, again you know it just uh, it happened once again well, in terms of lifetime bans I think it's certainly a three strike rule is is, uh, is a minimum and I, I, I would agree with you as well. I think Vinnie Fantini is a small team, small budget, and their entire 
uh, season is based on how they do in Giro d'Italia and that team could likely fold if they had to uh, withdraw early from Giro d'Italia so that could be a hammer blow to them and we don't want that uh, also there's an interesting rule now uh, with the movement for uh, clean cycling teams we saw uh, earlier in this race of course Sylvain George uh, tested positive uh, for heptaminol which uh, he says was uh, an over-the-counter uh, was something that was uh, contained in an over-the-counter treatment for uh, helping the circulation in his legs and it was an entirely innocent uh, mistake although it was a stupid mistake <laughs> for any athlete at this level uh, to be taking something without checking exactly what was uh, contained in it but uh, if it was a, a relatively minor infraction uh, then uh, then I think the rule that the movement for clean cycling people have uh, that says that ag 2 or now can continue to race in the Giro d'Italia and race well and they've got two overall contenders and they've given us plenty of entertainment uh, that they stay in the Giro d'Italia but then they miss the next uh, World Tour event which happens to be a uh, Criterium de Dauphiné which is absolutely massive for ag 2 or in terms of their sponsorship it's uh, their sponsors are based lo close to that region so from from that point of view, I think the decision-making process is probably the, uh, the way that uh, movement for clean cycling do it is probably the way to do it. So maybe Vinny Fantini, if they were signed up to that, could uh, think about missing the next World Tour event, but uh, stay in this one. So it's the uh, Uskaltels that have decided to control it. They've taken responsibility. Movistar seem uh, very active on the front. Lots of conversations going on with Astana about... Uh, exactly how they're going to uh, work about closing down this breakaway group over six minute the advantage for uh, four riders out front join us for the next part after these the race leader of Giro d'Italia Vincenzo Nibali is safely ensconced uh, just uh, towards the front of the main peloton as they work their way from Cilandro to Trecime de Lavaredo 211 kilometers in total uh, for the riders today slightly longer than build but uh, with fewer climbs, and that will be to the uh, great relief of this man in shot there in the red jersey. And from Amiga Pharma Quick Step, Mark Cavendish, who believes that the altered route, route profile as a result of the weather conditions offers uh, himself and his team an opportunity to perhaps uh, annex a few more points towards the uh, points competition and uh, prevent Cadell Evans from getting too close or indeed uh, even getting too big a lead should Cadell Evans manage to come up with a good result at the top of the uh, final climb to Trecime de Lavaredo. Much altered uh, route today. The uh, passes of Costalunga, San Pellegrino and uh, Giao have been, all been removed. So it's a radically altered, some would say emasculated stage, but I tell you what, this is a really, really tough stage for these riders today. It just rises the whole time, and the way that the riders uh, will ride it, it's not going to be an easy one. They'll, uh, they'll all be lined out for a lot of the day and there'll be a lot of very tired legs at the end of it, I can assure you. There's certainly a lot of uh, very tired legs at the start of it. So you can be sure that uh, there'll be plenty of riders in there that uh, whatever the, the fact that the uh, route profile has been altered might offer them a better chance of making it inside the time cup, but they're going to be really tired today. Canel Evans there in the middle of the group. Uh, he's got uh, Lamprey to the right, Sky to the left. He's got a BMC teammate just behind him and uh, Vacon Soleil just in front. Cadell Evans, uh, Tour de France winner in uh, 2011. Former world champion as well. Of course, uh, superb win in Mendricio. And he has uh, worn the pink jersey of race leader of the Giro d'Italia in the past. But it doesn't look now as if he's uh, going to get the victory. And Sean, how important do you think the points competition is going to be for him? Let, let's just uh, take you through it. 113 points for Mark Cavendish. Uh, 109 points for Cadell Evans, just uh, four points behind. And now Vincenzo Nibli has interestingly enough moved into the frame. He's 10 points behind Mark Cavendish. And while it's definitely not uh, Vincenzo Nibli's main main goal, perhaps if he comes up with a victory today, he might have an opportunity of uh, pinching it as well. Yes, uh, and I think uh, that is the reason as well. Maybe we're seeing uh, Omega Pama Quickstep uh, continue on to ride here. Uh, and uh, try and get the uh, points at the intermediate sprints out on the road um, because there's a lot of uh, the general classification I mean, as, you ca as you said Cat 11 is only at 4 points and then Nibali has moved up uh, to third place, he's only at 10 points behind uh, so I think uh, Mark Cavendish is concerned about that that you know they will pick up some points today at the finish so he wants to just uh, get the maximum points out of the stage today and then do the rest tomorrow um, and that's all you can do um, he'll be hoping that uh, yes, the likes of um, 
Evans and Nibali for the stage victory um, the, you know that they, they don't really be in a position to contest it but uh, if it comes to the final mount of the day of course Nibali will be up there and I think uh, Vincent and Nibali especially he would like to win a mountain stage he has won his stage now we talked about that a number of days he won the time trial but to win a mountain stage although it's not a big uh, a big mountain stage today it's still you know an important stage to win and when you're race leader uh, you like to, you know to do that before the race end and he is so uh, comfortable in the race he's looking so strong everywhere you know with the team uh, they have uh, never been in any difficulty so I think uh, he will be really up to try and get a state victory and that's going to be where it gets complicated from Mark Cavendish and that's the reason he has to try and pick up those uh, intermediate uh, points as the um, for the um, classament in the on the road today and get as, get as much out as possible and then try and do the rest tomorrow in the final stage. Do you think for Evans it's something he's you know really serious about, or is it just something like you say might come to him? Or and is there anything he can do to prevent Mark Cavendish uh, from scoring maximum points, or would he just have to do his own race? Is there any way that they can think about? Uh, you know, allowing those points to go, those intermediate points? No, there's not a lot you can do today. Uh, of course, uh, if it had been the normal stage, uh, you know, which was originally with the uh, with four p four climbs to go over, um, and, you know, there was two big ones to get over before you got to the uh, first intermediate uh, sprint of the day, uh, that would have been a situation. It was also on an uphill and quite, you know, after, fl after climbing six or eight kilometres into the uh, the Paso Jai, um, he, you know, Evans would be able to pick up some... Um, uh, points there, uh, but um, you know it, it would be possible to do something against Cavendish on that sit stage. But now the stage being changed is totally like just going gradually, very gradually uphill. And uh, you know, Cavendish is going to you know possibly get back to this breakaway uh, before the um, the bonification point, that sprint point, where he will pick up a uh, quite a number of points. And it's possible also for the second one of the day because you know it's not a it's not getting too difficult before that point either. And um, uh, it looks like that. That's what uh, the tactic is. So for um, for Evans, you know, there's not a lot you can do with the change route. And unfortunately, yesterday stage, if that had been included in the race and we went over all that those climbs yesterday, a mountain top finish as well. Well, then I think uh, Cad Evans would have picked up some points on both of those stages yesterday and today. But unfortunately, uh, weather conditions has put a stop to all of that. Plenty of cooperation in the bunch at the moment. Malia Rosa group containing uh, race leader Vincenzo Nibli is quite a bit uh, further ahead of this. Sean, why are Escotel controlling? What's the uh, thinking there? Well, I'm looking at uh, the situation and, uh, you know, why are they controlling? It's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, you know, the, um, the classification and the team classification, it's, um, it doesn't look like Escotel, you know, or anywhere uh, in the in the classification they are at 49 minutes uh, in general so they don't have uh, you know a chance of pulling that amount of time back um it must be for the stage victory that uh, they think uh, uh, samuel sanchez we did see in the time trial he did an excellent time trial the other day but unfortunately nibbly was just you know so strong um he took the victory from him so uh, getting good in the race and i think uh, that's the that's the reason i uh, understand from what they're doing at the moment they want to you know get this one back and uh, have a go for the stage victory with uh, samuel sanchez Samuel Sanchez has looked stronger and stronger as this race has gone on. He's been prominent in the uh, in the front group on the stages approaching the time trial a few days ago. Speaking of the time trial, we lost uh, Maxim Belkov uh, in the time trial. Both himself and Manuel Belletti, Belkov of the uh, Katusha squad, Belletti of uh, AG Tour Le Mondial. Both those two riders were outside the time limit of the time trial, which is was a huge disappointment. Belletti, though, had a pretty good excuse. He had a mechanical in the first kilometre and... Uh, he was able to successfully appear, uh, appeal to the race judges. Alan Kangert uh, dropping back through the group. He's going back to the car, no doubt, to uh, pick up some drinks and some some food for Nibli and Co. Trojan work that he's done for Nibli in this race. He's uh, been very impressive indeed. He's still able to stay well up there towards the end as well, so he's... Uh, stayed well to the fore but for uh, Maxim Belkov uh, just to finish that one off he, he's, uh, he's ill unfortunately so he wasn't able to uh, do the time necessary to stay inside the time limit so he must have been very ill indeed and that's very disappointing because uh, of course he produced a great solo stage success early in the race and 
won't unfortunately get to see the finish in Brescia, but still contributed to a very successful Giro d'Italia for the Katusha squad. And Kangert uh, looks as if he's going to take this uh, opportunity for a short and natural break. Manages to find a spot inside the trees. And uh, four riders up front. Kangert takes a natural break. We're going to take this opportunity for a short commercial break. Inside 130 kilometers to go on stage 20 of the Giro d'Italia. Cilandro to Trecime di Lavaredo is the route for the riders today. And uh, there are four riders up front and they have uh, that gap of six minutes and 50 seconds. So hovering between in six and seven minutes, the uh, group at the front controlling it is the uh, Uscaltel squad. There's the scene at the finish line at uh, Trecime di Lavaredo. It's a hell of a slog up here if you're carrying that rucksack on your back. A few questions in uh, asking whether we're going to have helicopter shots at the finish. Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, I think Bridie Jenner was on asking that question. I certainly hope so at the moment. No problems at all with the uh, helicopter pictures. And, of course, we've got the static cameras uh, at the finish line. The uh, finish line at 2,300 metres. And uh, anything above 1,000 metres in the Dolomites is uh, tending to uh, uh, be snowbound or snow covered at the very least this a radically altered uh, route today if you're just joining us and you haven't heard the news well the news uh, sort of broke yesterday about how they decided to alter the route the uh, passes of Costalunga, San Pellegrino and uh, Giao have all been removed from the race but we've retained uh, the uh, Paso Tre Croce along with the final climb to the finish uh, at uh, Trecima de Lavaredo. It actually goes up in sort of three ramps. There's another one in between uh, that isn't classified. The uh, Sant'Angelo, which is a uh, very short but very steep little ramp. And then they have a little downhill section. And then the last, well, the last three and a half kilometers are really, really very challenging indeed. Up to 18% on the uh, Trecima de Lavaredo little 18% uh, ramp, as I said, uh, of uh, Sant'Angelo. And then the uh, Tre Croce is uh, much more benign, uh, but uh, no less difficult for all that. About 7.5% uh, average for uh, 7.9 kilometers. So it's no gimme, and especially uh, with uh, three weeks in your legs. Whatever about the uh, extra rest day. Someone asked yesterday whether uh, they'd prefer, they would have preferred uh, a few hours in the snow and the mountains to uh, time on the turbo well I think they probably actually would have preferred the turbo yesterday not that uh, not that they'd ordinarily be rushing to have a go at that four riders up front Jaro Ermetti Pavel Brut of uh, Jaro Ermetti is the of the Androni uh, Giocatoli squad Pavel Brut of Katusha Adam Hansen of the uh, Lotto Belisol and uh, Yaroslav Popovic of uh, the Radio Shack squad. And the uh, best place of these overall is Adam Hansen. He's over two hours down. There's no threat overall. No real threat to anyone's position there. So those four riders, it's a nice composition in terms of uh, the bunch letting them go clear. But now up front, the Uskaltel team have decided to uh, set the agenda. Earlier on, they were helped a little bit by Amiga Pharma Quick Step, but obviously uh, Amiga Pharma Quick Step are not looking at gift horse in the mouth. Look at the... Uh, conditions well the snow has been falling steadily since uh, since before uh, the start of today's stage just uh, a little bit uh, less than freezing and the riders are going to feel cold going up there but uh, they'll be able to wrap up warm before the final hill and at least they're going uphill and at the moment the road surface is fine for riding and uh, well th those sort of conditions produced an absolutely epic finish on the Galibier last uh, Sunday so I don't think the riders will be hugely affected or will feel that uh, it's not something they ought to be doing. And Michele Alcoroni was actually quick to pay tribute to the riders and the support that he got for, first of all, for yesterday's cancellation, but also for the uh, route, route alterations and the importance, he says, of uh, getting a race today. And absolutely, the, the riders have been uh, in consultation with Acquironi. And Acquironi seems to be uh, the sort of uh, race director that likes to listen to the riders, likes to listen to the other uh, team owners and uh, team managers and actually get uh, get feedback and it's a sort of a 
he seems to be very popular amongst the teams and that's important because his immediate predecessor uh, Zemenian had a slightly more difficult relationship uh, with the teams and riders and uh, he produced absolutely extraordinary routes for the spectators to watch but uh, the riders weren't always so happy about it so this is the first time in 24 years of course uh, yesterday's stage that uh, the stage was uh, cancelled due to the weather. There have been uh, quite a lot of uh, cancelled stages over the years. Of course, in uh, 2011, the uh, Genoa to Livorno stage was cancelled uh, following the death of uh, Wouter Wayland. And uh, we've had cancellations uh, due to police raids. Uh, Trento to Santa Catarina Valforva was the uh, stage in 1989, cancelled due to bad weather. Environmentalists uh, rally stopped the stage at the last kilometer of the uh, 1988 Parma to Val Formida. Metal workers strike blocked the stage and forced the cancellation of the 1983 prologue in Brescia. And we lost the stage in 1969 Trento to uh, Malga Chapella. The Marmalada was climbed then, it uh, would have been, but unfortunately the bad weather put uh, pay to that. In 1946, Rovigo to Trieste blocked at uh, Pieris by stone-throwing protesters. It took it seriously in those days. Actually, the, the um, stage to uh, Trecima de Lavaredo in 1967. Uh, the Lavaredo, of course, it has been uh, the rendezvous for quite a lot of the finishing point for quite a lot of uh, Giro stages over the years. But the 1967 one was a bit of a black mark on the history of the race because the uh, spectator, I think the first time it was used, and the spectators were so enthusiastic as they tended to be in those days that they uh, pretty much pushed every Italian up the hill. And they were just uh, they were all slingshot up the hill at extraordinary rates. And uh, well, at the end of it, the uh, organisers just decided that uh, well, that's a complete write-off and uh, just draw a line under that. Might have been Jumondi that uh, got over the line first, but I'm sure someone will tell me. And now. To Despite the attention of Uskaltel on the front, Tamaridis, of course, has been uh, very active in the sprints uh, on up the road in the first week, and now he's uh, slogging away on the front trying to uh, set a pace that will keep this group under control, but the gap is going out. Uh, seven minutes and 39 seconds for these four riders up front on the right-hand side. under 740 to those uh, riders up front so it's uh, it's stretching out and at what point do they become uh, contenders for race victory Adam Hansen of course has already has a stage win Sean well I think they need to pull out their advantage uh, you know much more um, we can see there you know that 740 uh, with uh, 123 kilometers to go um, you know, they would be even 15 minutes uh, at this point and uh, it always depends on the peloton as well uh, because Escatel are going to continue riding and uh, then there will be other teams who will start uh, putting men up there as well because they will see that the breakaway is not out of reach, it's possible to put them back before the final climb and uh, the ones who have uh, you know, uh, riders that can take a stage victory on the mountaintop finish we will see more of them uh, teams uh, getting present on the front so it's, it's surprising Escatel, the reason they're riding um, if it's for the stage victory, they're taking it up very early and, you know, taking it all, uh, taking all the weight of the race on their shoulders, where I think, you know, there should be other teams um, contributing here. Um, uh, we did see uh, Mobistar there uh, and, you know, they were coming up and it seems to be that there's some rivalry going on here maybe between the Spanish teams. Uh, because it's a uh, it's real early time to for Escatel to take it up at this point. Uh, I think uh, if they knocked it off, and you know there'd be other teams who would want to take it up also because they're thinking of stage victory also. If that was Escatel, are thinking with Samuel Sanchez today. Hasn't been a great uh, Giro d'Italia for the Escatel team, has it, uh, Sean? They haven't really uh, come up with uh, huge results. Uh, it's a few teams have uh, been very successful in this race. One thinks immediately of the Movistar team, and of course Escatel team also from uh, from Spain based in the Basque region. Yes, um, 
a little bit of jealousy of the fourth stage, the four stage wins for the Moby Star team. Perhaps it's very possible that you know the other team has, uh, have got a lot of uh, exposure, won a lot of stages here. Moby Star, you know, um, having a fabulous race, winning uh, all the, all those stages, having with. Um, in charge to having the pink jersey for one day, uh, so it's been a fabulous tour for them. It's one of the one of the best uh, performance for a team in this race. And Escatel, of course, you know they haven't had a good um, good results in this, so maybe they feel they have to try and do something today, last chance, and uh, you know take up the race. And the directors put him on the front to make sure that this breakaway is not allowed to, pay, to take 15 or 20 minutes of advantage, uh, because with the men out there in the general classification, as you said, you know two hours and. Uh, three minutes is uh, is the time for Hansen so they have you know no possibility of doing anything in the in the top 20 of the general classification but uh, it seems like that you know they're out to control the situation today and try and get a stage victory for the Basque team okay it's almost seven minutes and 40 seconds for those four riders up front as they toil towards Chima de Laborator. It's the penultimate stage of the Giro d'Italia, stage 20 from Cilandro to Trecime de Lavaredo, 211 kilometers in total for the riders today. Four riders out front have an advantage of uh, 7 minutes and 40 seconds over the peloton, which is uh, being managed at the moment by the Uskeltel team, which clearly has ambitions for uh, perhaps Samuel Sanchez later on today and working our way through the uh, Dolomite region. That uh, well, It's a very interesting cultural uh, combination it's, uh, it's 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 very german very austrian very uh, uh, very italian and i think there's uh, it's quite a lot of german spoken in this part of the world amongst the uh, amongst the italians huge concentration of castles as well the uh, bozen or bolzano as it's known in italian uh, town that we went through a little earlier has the uh, highest concentration of castles in the world or something some extraordinary statistics so uh, yeah plenty of uh, gorgeous scenery stage started of course in the uh, beautiful town of cilandro the capital of the uh, val Vena venosta ski area little town that uh, rises on the slopes of a hill just to the left of the uh, dj alps all about uh, fruit production in that neck of the woods. Yeah, the Bolzano Basin has Europe's greatest concentration of castles, it says here, according to my notes. Not that any of these guys are looking at them. Four riders up front are Jaro Ermetti of Androni Giocattoli, Venezuela, Pavel Brut of Katusha. Adam Hansen of uh, the Lotto Belasol squad and uh, Yaroslav Popovic of the Radio Shack team. Best placed, as I say, Adam Hansen, uh, 75th overall. Hansen already with a stage victory in this race. He's sitting in third position. Number 137 there. Makes his own shoes. He's the uh, Peloton patron saint of quality footwear. And the Australian former triathlete. Uh, took victory on stage seven. Head of uh, Enrico Bataglin was uh, second on that occasion. Bataglin, of course, uh, exited the race in dramatic fashion. He, he took a stage victory, uh, if you remember, uh, on stage four into uh, Serra San Bruno and uh, crashed out later in the race and has only, only got out of hospital yesterday. So uh, best wishes to Giovanni Bataglin of the uh, Bardiani Valvoli team. Short, uh, thin, but very, very fast in the sprint. And Bataglin has a uh, good, good future in the sport. Uh, unfortunately, uh, broken ribs uh, and he punctured lung and uh, very painful indeed. So wish him well in his recovery. Hope he's back on the bike uh, very shortly. So the gap coming down ever so slightly, but remaining relatively steady at just over uh, seven and a half minutes. And uh, look at the way the uh, the bunch is being lined out by the Uskaltel team. Next up is Astana. They're just uh, sitting pretty in the box seat behind the Uskaltel team. Uh, four riders setting the pace. And it's a pretty hectic one, which suggests that those four riders up front are doing very well indeed to control this gap. Yes, they are pushing on. And, uh Putting on real strong here, uh, you know, with the advantage uh, for the breakaway. Uh, not... Um, 
uh, getting out of control at this moment because you know 117 kilometers to go uh, surprising to see them ride so fast on the front of the group and uh, the biggest surprise I suppose of all is why are they riding because there's no classification where they're losing something here um, general classification we can see that uh, uh, Sanchez down in 10th place at 9.36 overall and uh, Inchasti is just ahead of him at 8. Uh, Sanchez, sorry, 9.34 and uh, uh, Inchasti at uh, 8.36. Uh, so there's just, you know, 58 seconds there between them. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's no re there's no reason for them to ride in that case. Um, maybe there's a little bit of a battle on for, you know, the best Spanish rider in the race, but... Uh, um, it's uh, much uh, too early to do that. You can do that all on the final climb, and um, I have no idea what the tactic is uh, that taking it up at this point uh, so far out. And they have been on the front leg for you know a lot of time now already. They have been there for the last 25, 30 kilometres certainly. So the average speed 46.2 uh, kilometres an hour almost. Adam Hansen looks relaxed in second position behind this man, Yaroslav Popovic. Uh, Someone wants to know why I called him the patron saint of quality footwear. Well, he makes his own shoes. I thought I'd uh, said that. If you just get a, a sight of them there, they're made from carbon fibre. It's just uh, absolutely minimal. Probably the lightest shoes you could ever imagine. Just a couple of sheets of carbon fibre that he's uh, bonded together. Held together with a very rudimentary uh, fixing system. But very, very impressive work from uh, Adam Hansen. And he thinks they're the most comfortable thing ever. And no doubt he'll get a few orders after uh, after the Giro as a result of the uh, publicity he gave them with that victory. Nibali looking uh, not too concerned at the moment. He's been absolutely peerless. Uh, got a, a question the other day, Sean. What's your what's your highlight of the uh, Giro d'Italia today? To date, to this point. Well, you I pick out one special moment? Well, I think the moment was when we see uh, Bradley Wiggins getting in difficulty. Uh, you know, it was um, a big surprise to me. Um, first of all, he had the problems, you know, falling on that uh, treacherous conditions on the descent and then having made a difficulty getting down and from there on, the way he suffered. And, uh, you know, that was... Uh, um, that represented a huge change a in the race. change in the yeah. race, exactly, because, uh, you know, the, uh, the general classification then, uh, we were expecting him to be very much up there. And... Um, uh, we did learn later, of course. You know, he was uh, suffering. He was sick. He had a chest infection, all of that. But uh, yeah, that was a uh, that was a turning point of the race, and um, it would have been a real interesting one if you know Bradley Wiggins had got into the race and he was in good shape to see what way he could ride against Nibali because he has been so strong here. Uh, that is the other side, I suppose. Nibali, you know, he. Uh, time trialing mountain stages he hasn't been in difficulty anywhere and uh, because you know losing uh, Bradley Wiggins and I suppose Heijdal as well going out of the race you know taking another big favourite if he was in the shape he was last year or anything near that well then it would have been you know, an interesting battle in the mountain stages and you know the weather of course uh, that took a lot from the race and it's going to be talked about a lot um, you know whoever wins this race they're going to say well sure, that was the year they didn't do any climbs <laughs> at all unfortunately for Vincent Nibali and you know he would prefer as well if the big mountain stages were in because the way he's riding the form he's in he would probably have won you know a real big mountain stage if he doesn't win today um he would you know yesterday and today the normal stage is when we had four or five major climbs to go over uh, i think he would be you know really up for to win a stage so you know there's a, there's a lot of things about this race which are uh, a little bit disappointing i suppose at the end when you when you see the big favorites going out and then the route uh, you know change a lot because of weather conditions um uh, not as exciting as i was hoping it would be I mean, a lot of people have said, well, you know, nobody's attacked him. I mean, there was that day that uh, Rigoberto Urán went up the road. At that time, of course, uh, Bradley Wiggins was still involved. And actually, that gave me my, my single key moment of the race. I think when, when Nibali um, had that little moment when his, uh, he dropped his chain and then he managed to sort of hook it back on really quickly and then was able to scoot back up and almost took the front wheel out from uh, uh, Cadell Evans as he went past him and then bang, was straight back on the on the front of the group and, and controlling, uh, I think it was a Betancourt at the time, or Pozzavivo. But that, that, that moment where he was just able to just respond like that when everyone else was pretty much on the limit, I thought, well, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a level above and I, I don't think anyone's going to beat him in this race. No, and that was, I suppose, the uh, taste of the... Um the difficult mountain stages to come and um, if, if you have a stage where you have to do you know three four mountains and then finish with a mountain top finish it is very energy sapping and you know everybody uh, arrives at the end of the stage really tired uh, energy you know is uh, running out big time and then you can see differences appearing cracks appearing in the big favors 
Um, and in this race, we just haven't got that. Uh, we haven't had the route to do that to the riders and you know to really make the race difficult and to put them to the limit. Yeah, I mean, if they can't, uh, if they're on the limit, they can't attack. So, I mean, you know, saying you, you haven't seen attacks on uh, Vincenzo Nibali, well, people are not capable of attacking. That's uh, that's that's just what's going to happen, and that's not Nibali's fault. That doesn't mean that he's any less of a champion for that fact. He has got a stage victory, so I think he'll be a lot more relaxed going into this stage, and we might see him striking out for glory and perhaps uh, trying to control some of the, uh, the lesser riders that aren't necessarily a threat on GC the uh, different standings as the Omega Pharma quick steps watch the Uskaltels toil away in chase of these four breakaway riders still have a comfortable advantage Welcome back inside seven and a half minutes for the uh, four riders up front on stage 20 of Giro d'Italia from Cilandro to Trecime de Lavaredo Cadell Evans uh, looking cool, calm and collected ahead of challenges to come later in this stage. The uh, climb to Trecime de Lavaredo is the Chima Coppi, the highest point of the race. Extremely tough uh, last three kilometres and perhaps an opportunity for uh, Cadell Evans to uh, get something from this race. At the moment, he, well, of course, he needs to try and hang on to that uh, second position overall. So that's a primary consideration for the Australian riders. Four minutes and two seconds behind Vincenzo Nibali, but critically just... 10 seconds ahead of Rigoberto Uran of the uh, Sky Pro Cycling Squad who sits in third position at the moment uh, with his eyes on a potential for greater glory Mark Cavendish has uh, Mikhail Golas and the rest of his uh, Omega Pharma Quick Step team for company as they sit and watch the efforts of the Uskaltel team at the front of the peloton Vincenzo Nibali there is uh, safely towards the front but not on the front that's these four riders from Uskeltel that have been uh, piling it on as best they can but the four riders up front are doing a great job uh, you've got some decent firepower up there in the shape of uh, Jaro Ermetti and Johnny Giacottoli uh, Venezuela particularly though uh, Pavel Brut of Katusha Adam Hansen big strong engine from uh, Lotto Belisol has already come up with a stage win in this year's race and Yaroslav uh, Popovic in the uh, twilight of his career uh, from the Radio Shack team, a career that uh, many people expected would produce more, but uh, up and down career, but for uh, Popovic, he's still capable of generating significant power, and uh, while the gap is coming down to the group behind, they're, they're doing a very good job indeed uh, up front. Those are the four, four riders that have the advantage. And before the break, we were talking about the uh, highlights of the race. Uh, Georgie F, a regular uh, contributor to our broadcasts on the uh, Giro d'Italia, suggests that the uh, big highlight has got to be the spectator falling over that time. Do you remember uh, which mountain was it? Spectator was on there. Was a little left-hand uh, corner, very steep hill, and spectator just uh, took a step back. And well, I haven't heard that that spectator was injured, and I certainly hope not, because I'd hate to be. Uh, smiling at someone's misfortune but it really was one of the, the the comedy moment of this race that's the scene at the finish line at uh, Trecima de Lavaredo and snow just continuing to pour down it, it, it poured down overnight but it didn't um, stick to the extent that it uh, blocked the road in any significant way and of course there's plenty of uh, plenty of dumper trucks and diggers and things like that out there ready to uh, plow the snow out of the way so that's um, at the moment there's certainly no question of it being difficult uh, of there being a problem about getting the uh, riders to the finish seen over uh, Brixen all the towns in the, this part of the Dolomites Bressanone is the Italian version they tend to have uh, two languages on all the uh, on all the road signs four riders up front Giaro Ermetti is probably the least uh, well known of all of them he's uh, 32 years of age now. Best result in the Giro d'Italia is probably a fourth in the uh, team time trial back in 2009 and uh, team time trial victory in the uh, Lombardy Cycling Week back in 2009. 
So he's a good team player, but uh, not necessarily a star in his own right. But uh, getting a chance to shine, and we've seen pretty much all of the uh, Andrade Giacatoli team. There he is on the back there. Hermetti in, amin in amongst some uh, powerful riders there in the shape of uh, Pavel Brut on the front in the red of Katusha. Next up uh, for Radio Shack is Yaroslav Popovich, then Adam Hansen and Hermetti at the back. And as you mentioned, uh, Popovic at the end of his career, back in 2003, uh, he finished uh, third on the podium overall, uh, won by uh, Simone and Garzelli in second place, and uh, he was uh, not that far down in general classification, 11 minutes and uh, 7 minutes and 11 seconds, I suppose, uh, between the top three. Nowadays, it's uh, uh, you see a lot of the big races much tighter, but uh, you know he was a promising rider at the beginning of his career, able to do a big race like. Uh, like Giro, a three-week race, looking very promising, but he didn't live up to that. He went to teams, and then he became one of these super domestiques, and he's been you know, in that role for many years now. Michael Sandiford is asking, which riders have impressed and disappointed for you in this year's uh, Giro? Any names? Well, obviously the most impressive is going to be Vincenzo and Nibali, but... Uh, Anyone uh, came out of left field and producing uh, good results and good to see? Um, coming out, um, I don't think there's anybody that really came out and uh, you know produced a performance that um, uh, was exceptional. Um, disappointments, there's a lot of them in there. And when you look at the teams, uh, you know there's some very strong teams who haven't got anything out of the race. Uh, you know, you look at Blanco, for example. Um, guessing, looking good in the earlier part, but you know, really struggling in the last week of the race and getting sick, and then out, and they haven't got a stage victory. And you know, a team that can get a stage victory, the uh, Pro Tour teams, you would expect them to have a, a stage victory. If not, they should be up there in the general classification in the top five and to get some exposure that way. So, you know, Blanco is the one who's uh, probably you know, um, losing out. Ulrika Greenedge also, you would have expected them to get a stage victory with Matty Goss, but it didn't work out for them. Yeah, he was sick. He retired there a few days ago. Yeah. Yes, and out of the yeah. race. But uh, they tried, you know, with other um, Brett Lancaster, they tried on a few occasions to get something out of the sprints. We're, we're active in the breakaways, and we see Peter winning up there quite a lot. Uh, but still, they did not get a stage victory. And, a team like that, if they could get one stage victory out of it, well, then it would make the race good, really, really good for them. Um, Androni, the ones who you know always try in, are almost every year get a stage victory out of it, but this year they have been really up there in the breakaway. It's very present uh, and uh, just not getting a stage. And uh, again, you know, here today we have the man out there. Uh, uh, Ermetti, so they were hoping to get that breakaway to go all the way to the finish and if the four men out front were allowed that uh, 12 minutes or 15 minute advantage and go to the final climb the last 25 kilometres with 12 or 14 minutes in advantage, well then I think he would be the man who could uh, win the stage today because uh, uh, he would be the better climber for me, although Adam Hansen, he was the surprise the day he won the stage, he you know, looked like the one who would get into difficulty in the final, but uh, you know, put in a great uh, a great effort, effort, yeah. A great effort, a bit uh, 30, 40 kilometers in the yeah, end. Yeah, Debbie so B said it on uh, Twitter. Adam Hansen has been having a great Giro, so she's uh, very much in agreement with that assessment. Yes, well, he won a magnificent stage, and when you look at the profile of the stage when they're the breakaway, I, I, was, I was under the impression that he would get into difficulty, but... Uh, you know he's he's had a great stage and for that um, great stage victory and for that Lotto Bella Sol has been a real good tour for them. So the ones who haven't got Canon yet as well, you know they they've been here and they're hoping to get stage victories because they really hadn't something for the general classification and you know also disappoint for them. So for the big teams who are not getting something in the general or haven't got a stage win is disappointing. But some of the smaller teams has had a fabulous race. Yeah, Cannondale would have come in with big expectations, but the blow of losing Ivan Basso just before the start. Uh, certainly affected morale and they really didn't have anyone to step up they got a good uh, result in the stage to uh, the time trial just the other day with damiano caruso in the top three but uh, well they've been pretty anonymous uh, otherwise and uh, unfortunately elia viviani hasn't really been able to step up in the sprints against uh, mark cavendish so there's the scene at the uh, finish in trechima de Navarredo. that's where the riders are working their way towards now Inside seven minutes now for the four riders up front who are uh, working their way towards Trecime de Lavaredo on this uh, 211 uh, kilometer uh, ride for the riders today. They're all lined out, uh, being led by Uskal Tel in the chase of the four riders up front. Jaro Metti of Androni Giocattoli, Pavel Brut of Katusha, Adam Hansen of Lotto Belasol and uh, Yaroslav 
Popovich of the Radio Shack squad. As they hit one of these uh, interminable little drags, it's it's pretty much uphill all the way. It goes downhill in little bits, but uh, it's more up than down from the start to the finish. These the four riders on up front, slogging away. Pavel Brut on the front for Katusha. Yaroslav Popovich uh, next in line, Adam Hansen and uh, Jaro Ermetti at the back. These four riders, as I say, had almost uh, almost eight minutes at one stage. Now down well inside seven. And the question is, what sort of a gap do they need when they come to the, uh, the final climbs? Well, probably this and more. Because there's quite a lot of climbing in the conclusion of this stage. Uh, so much talk, of course, about the fact that about the uh, climbs that they've taken out of this stage. But that doesn't mean it's an easy one by any means. Costalunga, the uh, San Pellegrino, and the Jao have all been removed, but we still have uh, Tre Croce, the uh, Sant'Angelo, and of course, uh, which is just a, a very short ramp, uh, and then the final, uh, very very uh, precipitous steep climb to Trecima de Lavaredo. For these uh, riders, uh, talking about highlights of the Giro d'Italia, a bit of review today, as much as uh, as a look at the stage itself. Uh, Almost three weeks of racing now, the penultimate stage, tomorrow's uh, final trek into Brescia. And someone did act uh, actually ask uh, earlier, uh, do you think there'll be any GC fighting tomorrow on the road to Brescia or is it like the Tour de France? Well, Sean, no, it'll probably be, you know, in this uh, in this instance, well, last year, of course, we had a final stage time trial, but in this instance, it's going to be just a final tour for the riders. Yes, uh, you know, three week tours, the final day, there's nothing difficult uh, um, on the uh, route and, um, it's normally the first 50% of the stage, they ride along at a casual pace and uh, then they race um, um, in the final just for stage victory really. But um, we have seen where, you know, the uh, general classification and uh, in the top 10, for example, if there's very little in it and there's um, a place for the grabs um, to move up. Uh, then we could see some action for the intermediate uh, intermediate sprint points but normally the guys who are up there they have difficulty getting up with the sprint anyway and in a team if you have a guy who is eighth in general classification he feel he can move up to sixth in that classification um, then there's going to be some other guys in the team who can sprint quite well and they will go for the bonification so it's always uh, it's always very difficult and rare to see you know where the uh, there's changes in the, in the top 10 but it does happen and you know, today, depending at the at the end of the stage, what the differences between the riders in the top five, top ten, and general classification, we could see a little bit of you know uh, going for the intermediate sprints, but they're not really contested. You know, from a long ways out, they just have a go at the sprint, the final kilometre lead into that, and try and get up there. But you know, the, as I said, the first three percent of the race will be pretty much of a promenade. Promenade, and then it could, uh, will be absolutely frenetic pace for the uh, final. Uh seven 4.2 kilometer circuits around Brescia 197 kilometers in total so it's it's not a it's not a tour I think it's usually quite a bit shorter the stage in the uh, Tour de France heading to the Champs Elysees that's the other difference with the Giro as, as well of course it moves around for the final stage it's not totally uh, rooted to one finish some people say uh, Milan is the natural place for it to finish uh, other people of course say well why not Rome uh, as a regular uh, finishing spot but that's not the tradition of the Giro d'Italia they like to go different places So on the uh, front, setting the pace, Ricardo Mestre for the Uskal Tel squad, as he has been for quite a while. That, uh, that jersey's, uh, uh, that gilet is showing signs of wear, isn't it? Limited amount of clothing for the riders, and uh, they'll have used it all up by this point. After being in the machine a lot, I think, in this race, with the bad conditions, uh, a lot of washing needed to be done for the riders, and we can see... Um, the effects and the wear of the, I think uh, the wash machine there on his gilet. Yeah, of course, in your days, you had to uh, you had to wash them yourselves. Yes, that was uh, in the good days when <laughs> you had to do it in the in the bathroom sink and uh, try and dry out your shorts. And uh, of course, back in the days when you had you know the the chamois, it was uh, so difficult to dry. It would take about three days to dry out. Well, now you know if you wash uh, wash your shorts. Uh, and uh, you know, wring them out well. Well, you know, they, they dry overnight. But in the, back in them days, um, how many pairs would you have? Three or four? Well, you would have three pairs at least because you would certainly need them. 
So they'd be going into the bag wet and then taking them out and trying to dry them out that night again? Yeah, so you give them to the masseur, of course, and you know, ask him when he, um, when he goes to your room to, to hang them up or put them maybe in the rear of the car during the daytime to dry them out. But uh, it was a struggle to, you know, to get them dry in the conditions that we've had in this year, for example, where there's no drying. When you're in the Tour of France, of course, you know, the real warm weather, well, then in a couple of hours, uh, they dry out so quickly. Different days. Even for a team leader, it's a surprise, really, when you think about it, isn't it? Certainly a surprise to me. A little cracks at the front of the peloton. The pace has been pretty high indeed, but still those four riders out front are controlling it. Okay, it's come down, but it hasn't come down in huge chunks. And you can tell that Uskaltel are really trying and setting a decent pace up there because, uh, well, nobody's got an opportunity to... Uh, they're not just riding along having a little chat. You can be sure of that. This is something we don't often see. We're getting the full, almost the full length of the stage today, and we get a full sense of the entire shape and the entire uh, narrative of this uh, of this stage 20, and just how demanding it is for the riders. You'll have a sense that at the end of the day, just how long a slog it's been, and just how much time they've spent in lineouts. You know, sometimes we see uh, when it comes when it comes live, it comes to the point where the uh, the riders are taking it easy. It might be just around the feed zone, and every everyone's a bit relaxed and chatting. And you think, well, that old cycling can't be that hard at all. But this is really, really demanding stuff. Uh, question came in to uh, British Eurosport actually, to the at uh, Eurosport uh, UK TV. Um, it's at TQ Sport is uh, is my uh, Twitter handle. And the question's coming in from Blair Livingston in Scotland asking, what's the difference between a domestique and a super domestique? Well, the super domestique are the riders uh, you know, who are able to ride every day on the front. They can ride in the mountains, uh, in the big mountain stages, and be there for 75% of the stage. And, uh, you know, there's only... Um, a small number of those uh, domestiques out there. And, uh, you know... We, you, you know, you're, you're amazed how much they can ride every day. Uh, they can just, uh, when they have the the race leaders um, jersey in the team, and uh, to control the race, they're just so powerful. And you know, to ride 200 kilometres and to be there on the front a lot of the time during the day, do day after day, and then in the mountain stages be still there. That's what you call a super domestic. Yeah, Super Domestiques, I suppose, for Sky Pro Cycling. Uh, Rigoberto Uran came into the race as the Super Domestique for Bradley Wiggins, but now he's very much a, a general classification contender in his own right, currently sitting third overall. And many people uh, believe that he's, indeed, his manager has pretty much said that uh, he's very much, he's, he's likely to leave Sky at the end of the year and uh, head to a team where he'll be given the position of uh, outright team leader. The likes of Richie Porte, I suppose, as well, and... Uh, in the Sky Pro Cycling squad. A couple of riders in there in Astana now helping uh, Vincenzo Nibali that will uh, perhaps be looking to the future. The likes of uh, Tanel Kangert, maybe Fabio Aru, although he's been very much a, a faithful domestic of, uh, of Nibali. Valeria Agnoli, those riders, but uh, certainly Tangert might, uh, might have uh, looked towards the future as someone who might uh, lead a team in his own right. Yes, well, I think he has the qualities. Uh, he's proven this Giro, but I don't look at um, those riders that have been super domestiques yet. And the ones, uh, Kirienka, he would, for me, be a super domestique. Popovich, who we have in the break today, when he was riding with US Postal, uh, when he was really at the top of his game, well, then he was, you know, one of the riders who could ride out in front all day and be still there in the, in the difficult mountain stages, not on the big, big mountains, but in the earlier uh, big calls he would be but when you get to the final one or two he would you know uh, be in difficulty but uh, I think of today Kirienke is definitely one for me uh, I can think of immediately as being one of the super domestics. Did you ever have anyone yourself that was uh, in that class was able to help you all day and all night? No never had anybody who was that, uh, that powerful and as I said you know you have to look down through uh, the start list uh, of a peloton of 207 riders as we had in this Giro and uh, you know you could maybe get two maximum three in in the, in the peloton that would be in that category Visconti had two brilliant stage victories in a matter of days definitely an outstanding performer says uh, Chris at love hate 24 7 this is uh, Twitter handle at DQ sport is mine if uh, you want to join this uh, little conversation about the uh, outstanding performers and uh, yeah impossible to rule out Visconti 
a rebirth, he says, this uh, Giro d'Italia has been for him after a difficult period in his life. And that uh, victory on the Galibier was certainly a spectacular one. It was extraordinary, w wonderful the way he was able to stay away and uh, epic conditions, of course. And we're going to have a similar conditions today, I think, for the uh, riders as they work their way to the finish. Yes, and I think this country, um, we, you know, we, I, I knew that he was capable of winning stages in the uh, in the Giro. He's proved in the past, but uh, just to get it right. And last year he went through a difficult time, uh, but he wasn't, you know, a big surprise to me. When you when he gets into the form, you know, to win the uh, championship of Italy, first of all, you have to be a good rider to do that. And uh, it's just a matter of getting uh, physically and mentally to be right for this Giro, and that's what Visconti you know, got into, got that, uh, and uh, you know, had two magnificent victories. Debbie B says, what about our Turbo Durbo, Luke Durbridge, outstanding young rider? Yes, he has uh, shown well up the, up the road for a long time a few days ago. Which stage was that? It blurs, but it was, uh, it was a great performance. He was out there half the day. Yes. And the well, rest? He is, you know, he's a really strong rider and a big powerful rider, a great time trialist. And uh, in this race, um, you know, the time trial, the long one we had well, maybe was a bit difficult, a uh, hill at the start and then a hill to finish. If we had, a, you know, a pan flat time trial, well, then he would have been up there with a big chance for stage victory. You're very welcome back to stage tw 20 of uh, Giro d'Italia. Cilandro to Trecime de Lavaredo. 211 kilometers for the riders and they pass innumerable castles along the way as you can see conditions uh, en route at the moment uh, pretty good indeed uh, plenty of riders been amongst the cars collecting uh, drinks uh, for their teammates food etc but the uh, peloton is going along at a decent slog because these four riders out front have uh, put it up to them maximum advantage of about 750 uh, seven minutes and 50 seconds now that's down at uh, less than six and a half minutes. And these four riders up front, Jaro Ermetti of Androni Giocattoli, Venezuela, Pavel Brut of uh, the Katusha squad, Adam Hansen of Lotto Belasol, and Yaroslav Popovic of Radio Shack. There's the race leader, Vincenzo Nibali, looks uh, relaxed. Cool, calm and collected and he has appeared so confident and why wouldn't he be because he has been utterly dominant in his performances. Finally got that stage win that he really, really wanted in the time trial uh, two days ago. Then got a day off yesterday which uh, surely to be happy about bearing in mind the, the weather conditions but I, I sort of sensed actually that he would like to have raced because I have a funny feeling that Vincenzo Nibali really wants to uh, strike out and go for stage honours today. We'll, uh, we'll certainly see on the road up to Trecime de Lavaredo. Of course, they, uh, just to remind you, if you're just joining us, they have removed the uh, three climbs, Paso Costa Longa, Paso de San Pellegrino, and Paso Giao. They've all been removed, but we've still been left, of course, with the Paso Tre Croce and the uh, final climb up to the finish at Trecime de Lavaredo. Which is no easy climb, I can tell you. The, uh, the, the final climb, seven kilometers in total. And some very, very uh, steep stretches along that 18%. Inside 100 kilometers to go now. And they're the 100 toughest kilometers of this route. Slightly extended route. Of course, it was uh, in for 203 kilometers. So now it's 211, but uh, should be slightly faster for the riders with the uh, reduced amount of climbing. Six minutes and 18 seconds now for those riders up front, although they have uh, been climbing out of the saddle for a little bit longer than the other riders behind. Got a sight of the Uskal Tel team uh, on the front. One of their riders putting on a cap. As the Astana squad uh, hold a watching brief behind the Spanish squad, the Basque team. As they tap out a rhythm that uh, is providing plenty of discomfort for riders throughout the peloton. Conversation through the uh, in the last little while has been about the, uh, the outstanding performers. And a couple of people have uh, given a shout out for Alex Dowsett, of course. First Grand Tour and he wins the time trial beating the Olympic champion, says uh, Jack Fillingham. Uh, there have been a couple of tweets for uh, for Alex Dowsett, who's uh, ploughing on manfully with the Movistar team. He won the first of uh, four stage victories for that team. And, of course, his teammate, uh, Ben Yetinchowski, wore the pink jersey in that time trial, didn't he? Two stage wins 
as well for uh, Visconti. And a stage victory too for Inchowski later on. Alex Dowsett uh, is still out there, 150th overall, 149th actually, since the departure of uh, Danilo De Luca. He's uh, over three hours and 20 minutes down on general classification, but heading towards the victory, the finish of his uh, first Grand Tour. And the man from Essex will be thrilled with that. Alan Morrissey's asking, I noticed the team classification has two tables, time and points, that they both recognised officially. Which do the bookies use? To be honest, I have no idea which the bookies use, although I would almost certainly say that it is the, the one done on time. That is the more important one for the team. And Sky, uh, of course, Sky Pro Cycling leads the uh, team classification by 5 minutes and 49 seconds over the, uh, the Blanco squad. Movistar uh, third, 7 minutes and 1 seconds down. Of course, uh, the Astana team were second in that classification going into the time trial, but I sense that uh, some of their riders might have soft-pedaled it as best they could in that time trial just to make sure that they had good legs for uh, yesterday's big mountain stage, which, of course, then subsequently was, uh, was cancelled. For Astana, still the focus is uh, absolutely, totally and utterly on getting Vincenzo Nibli to the finish line tomorrow afternoon in Brescia uh, in that uh, Maglia Rosa safely in there at the front and no surprise at that but for sky it would be at least some consolation if they can emerge with the uh, with the team success and indeed rigoberto uran still has uh, an excellent chance perhaps of moving into second place in this race remember he's just 10 seconds behind Kidel evans of the bmc squad evans uh, four minutes and two seconds behind and of course it's not absolutely all over for general classification. If anything extraordinary was to happen, and, and you know, the weather conditions at the finish line in Trecima de Lavaredo are, are not good. It's, uh, it's really very, very, uh, very, very cold indeed. And the snow has been pelting down all day and all night, pretty much relentlessly, although it's just that sort of snow doesn't, uh, it's not sticking in a way that it's uh, proving very difficult to clear away on the road. So. Road conditions still okay going uphill, but you certainly wouldn't want to uh, wouldn't want to descend on those conditions. And that's why the uh, race organisers, Michele Acquaroni, assisted by uh, Maro Veni, and that's why that they have uh, come up with a route that uh, goes steadily upwards pretty much all day long and has avoided uh, the big passes. What about this man, Rafael Maika? He's been uh, he's been a revelation. Two Polish riders in the top eight. And he is a man for the future. Rafael Maika sitting sixth overall. Six minutes and 45 seconds down on Vincenzo Nibali. Cadell Evans, or uh, Mark Cavendish, meanwhile. Well, he's got a different agenda. His focus, uh, having taken four stage victories, has been a very successful Giro d'Italia. Came into uh, the Giro and all sorts of talk about uh, the inability of the Amiga Pharma Quick Step team to provide him a decent lead out. Lead out. It's a uh, bit of a struggle in the first stage with that crash that splits the uh, peloton and then the uh, difficulty, the mechanical difficulties for Gert Stegemans. And then it all came right. And Mark Cavendish has just uh, that, that broad beaming smile has just got wider and wider as uh, this race has gone on. And believe you me, it'll be a cheesy grin on the podium in Brescia tomorrow if he's wearing the red. First of all, though, he has, needs to uh, traverse this stage, and there are a couple of uh, opportunities for him, perhaps, to uh, add to his points total. He's got uh, four-point advantage over Cadell Evans, ten-point advantage over Vincenzo Nibali. If Nibali uh, strikes out for a glory today and uh, Cavendish hits any sort of problems in Brescia tomorrow, well, you never know. Vincenzo Nibali could be doubling up in points and pink of overall leader. The two um, intermediate... Uh, classification sprints that offer eight points each for the uh, points classification. Well, one comes with 54 kilometers to go at Dobriato, and uh, the second of them comes with 22.1 kilometers to go, Cortina d'Amprezzo. That one might be a bridge too far for uh, Cavendish. But certainly, the first one should be well within his compass. Problem is, of course, that there are four riders up front. Still, there are points on offer uh, for uh, fifth and sixth, two, so two points there, and that could well be. Uh, what Mark Cavendish is targeting. 
So these four riders up front, uh, let's go through them again. Jaro Armetti of the Androni Giocattoli Venezuela squad. Pavel Brut of Katusha. There's Armetti. Oh, everyone loves those sunglasses. Are they Bollet? I'm not sure, I have no idea. Not a sunglasses expert, maybe someone can tell me. Jaro Armetti of Androni Giocattoli. Uh, Pavel Brut of Katusha is uh, on the front in the red and white colours, and that team have had a great Giro. Luca Paolini taking a stage victory, uh, wearing the Maglia Rosa for four days, I believe. And also a stage victory for uh, Maxim Belkov, uh, who unfortunately was outside the time limit uh, in the time trial a couple of days ago, so he's, uh, he's off the race. He was sick in that event, and, uh, well, that was a disappointment for him, but uh, still a successful Giro. Adam Hansen and uh, Yaroslav Popovic also in the break. As we look at uh, Rafael Michael wearing the Young Riders Classification Leaders jersey. Has that tiny advantage. And that, it, that is actually going to be one of the real scraps. Uh, we've been talking about the points and the calculations and all the sort of uh, permutations involved in that. And obviously we've been talking about general classification. But the, uh, the Young Riders classification, Sean, has been absolutely fascinating in this uh, race. And it's been a real ding-dong battle. Uh, between uh, Rafael Maika and uh, Carlos Betancourt of AG Tour Le Mondial and just uh, coming into the final mountain stage just two seconds between them it could go either way it certainly could and um, you know Betancourt is not finished uh, in this one today it's going to be uh, you know the opportunity the last opportunity for him to do something and uh, he is going to try and go for it and uh, when you look at the race and as we've talked about the um, the front end of the peloton here Escatel riding um, you know, the, there's a lot of teams who I think who um, want to ride for different reasons. I think AG2R would uh, be interested in trying to control it a little bit as well to get a stage victory there with uh, um, with Betancourt possibly or Pozo Viva because um, again, you know, they are uh, two specials in this uh, this sort of uh, this sort of stage. But um, Betancourt is going to try and you know pull as much time uh, from uh, Mike if he's capable of doing that. But uh, you know, Mike. Uh, he is uh, battling on big time. We see him in the time trial. For me, he was the one who was uh, really giving it 100% in the time trial. Earlier on, he looked like he was struggling with three, four kilometres to go, but just battled on bravely and uh, took over the young jersey classement from Betancourt on a time trial which would suit Betancourt more because up, uphill time trial, he did a magnificent job and you can be guaranteed there'll be a battle there today. Uh, Betancourt is going to have to try and you know take this and you know take a nice bit of an advantage, uh, not uh, one or two seconds because then you're down to the situation where we talked about a moment ago, the intermediate sprints. Um, you know there could be a little bit of a battle there, and Michael would have an advantage in that if he could pick up something in the intermediate sprints, um, time bonification. So um, Betancourt is going to have to try and you know pull a nice advantage out that it would secure him the overall victory in the Young Jersey Classament. Could be a good one. Rola Palooza on Twitter says, listening to TQ Sport on Eurosport and mending my neighbour's daughter's bike's punctures. Five holes in one tyre and counting. Uh, I think it's time to throw that one out. <laughs> Definitely throw the tube out. I think it's done its, uh, its tour of It'll cost of more duty. on patches. Yeah, really. Rabatini won the... Uh, Mountains classification last year hasn't been as successful for uh, for him this year and for Vinny Fantini this is a race just to be got through at this point they do of course have uh, Sant'Ambrosio sitting in sixth overall and uh, going well so Peloton lined out still uh, five uh, almost six minutes to the leaders in front So inside uh, six minutes advantage now for our four leaders up front on stage 20 of the Giro d'Italia. Cilandro to Trecime de Lavaredo are the start and finish points of today's penultimate stage of the uh, Giro d'Italia. Almost three weeks of racing for these uh, four riders and for all the riders behind them. Giaro Ermetti of Androni Giacatoli, he's uh, third in line here. The man on the back uh, you just saw going through shot was Adam Hansen of Lotto Bellaso. The man on the front is Pavel Brut of Katusha and uh, sitting on his wheel was Yaroslav Popovic of the Radio Shack uh, team. Five minutes 40 now and it's, uh, it's plummeting, it's coming down really quickly. The Oskaltel team, they have a quartet on the front and they've been sitting there for quite a long while. Vincenzo Nibali looking uh, cool, calm and collected in his Maglia Rosa, surrounded by his Istana teammates as the break raced through the feed zone. 
They've been able to get uh, plenty of food and water from their team cars without any difficulty. So no enthusiasm for grabbing a musette there from the uh, from the break because they realise that their lead is under threat and they're pushing hard. I think they're going to use the feed zone as an opportunity maybe to get a few extra seconds. They'll uh, uh, they'll keep uh, pushing. They keep pushing on where the uh, peloton are likely to slow up. So uh, Nibali looks relaxed enough, chatting away and thinking about challenges to come later in this stage. They've got the uh, Trecima de Lavaredo as the final climb, and of course uh, Tre Croce comes before that. Tre Croce is uh, just under eight kilometers, 7.5 percent average, and a max of 12 uh, percent. The uh, well, the Lavaredo is, well, it's hard to assess really, it's sort of two hills. It's about seven kilometres in total of, uh, of climbing, but the last three or four kilometres are extremely steep indeed. And absolutely uh, bathed in white at the moment as a result of the relentless snows that have been falling. This, of course, the uh, Lavaredo will be the highest point of this year's Giro d'Italia. Cima Coppi at... Uh, just over 2,300 metres. There's the scene. They've kept that road clear, and it's been it's been a hell of a job. But the organisers need to be uh, need to be commended for their efforts because I don't think that Maro Vegni and uh, Michele Acoroni have had a wink of sleep for the last week, constantly revising the route and uh, assessing the situation. And Vegni says that he has. Uh, People placed, people that he trusts placed out at the route at key points right throughout the route today and he's in constant communication with those people and if there's any problem at all then he can uh, he can shut things down and bring it further down the hill but at the moment it looks absolutely fine uh, at the finish so there's no question that we won't get the full 211 kilometres which is uh, good news, uh, maybe not good news for Mark Cavendish but the way he's ridden in this uh, year's Giro d'Italia has really come into form And uh, enjoying the bit of chat with his uh, with his teammate Tiralongo. Because Tiralongo has been injured. He's uh, got a bit of a knee injury, so he's really had to battle through this. Luca Paolini has uh, had a very, very enjoyable debut Giro d'Italia at the early age of 36. We can see this, the discussions going on here. We did see just some moments ago where uh, Nibali went up to the front and he talked to the uh, the, the riders uh, from Escatel, uh, Mestre and uh, Minguez, and now we see Paulini uh, having a chat with one of the riders from Morbistar, uh, that is uh, Pablo Lastras, and uh, there is some problem there between the teams, definitely, because... Um, we see Nibali, he asked the rider, why are you chasing? Then he went back to his teammate and uh, he was saying, I don't I don't know, they don't know. Nobody seems to know what the uh, problem is. And what is the agenda? I mean, it is a tough one. Is it, is it just about uh, setting up Samuel Sanchez for the stage victory? No. It seems a little bit more than that, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it's more than that. I don't. I think there's, uh, yeah, there's some rivalry between the teams here. And we did see uh, Pablo Lastras coming up earlier on and putting the motorbike away. And um, there seems to be uh, some little friction between the team, I reckon. Uh, we'll have to wait and see because the way that riding they're really pushing on the bunch and at this point like with over 80 kilometers to go um you know and they have been doing it now for the last what 30 40 50 kilometers maybe um there are some rivalry between the teams definitely and we'll have to wait and see for more information on that but um certainly nobody or a lot of the riders are wondering why are they chasing so strong at this point in the race because you could allow the breakaway to have seven eight minutes at this point and you know close them down comfortably in the end well, intriguing stuff, and it could be to do with some some little niggle or some little argument that might have happened out on the road. It mightn't have been something that's festering for months or years or any obvious rivalry, but it could be just some difficulty between the teams as a result of something that's happened in uh, Giro d'Italia. So uh, Mark Cavendish might be feeling a little bit uh, a little bit more uncomfortable than he'd like through the feed zone for the Uskaltel riders, a momentary respite. And of course, uh, the Briders in the break, <laughs> they've really had to work for it. Work, you know, extremely hard as if they didn't always, but this is really uh, dragging it out of them. And what will they have as they get closer to the final?
Helen wants to know if tomorrow's stage is neutralised like the last stage of the Tour de France. No, well, the last day of the Tour de France, yeah, isn't, isn't officially neutralised, of course. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you, uh, you understand that. But, um, and no, t tomorrow's isn't officially neutralised either, but uh, it's like there isn't, there isn't going to be any challenge to uh, general classification. That would seem very unlikely. Unless, of course, it was, it was a second between them or something. You might see a bit of racing for the intermediate sprints. At the moment, there's uh, four minutes and two seconds between Vincenzo Nibali on uh, overall ahead of Cadell Evans. Further ten seconds back to uh, Rigoberto Uran. We haven't spoken much about Michele Scarponi, another uh, man with a checkered past, but uh, Scarponi has uh, really been in fine form for Lampre Merida. Now just over a minute behind uh, Uran, and in with a racer's chance of making it to the podium. He would dearly love that. Scarponi, of course, uh, inherited victory when uh, Alberto Contador's 2011 results were written from the record a couple of years ago. So Scarponi has uh, an overall success at Giro d'Italia to his name. So third wouldn't be quite as good, but still third would be uh, a pretty good result. And he'll push hard for that. What about Scarponi as a potential for today's uh, stage, Sean? Well, I think, uh, again, you know, you can never count uh, Scarponi out. Uh, sometimes he looks to be struggling uh, on the mountain day and he comes back in the following day and he puts in a big performance. He's a real fighter, you know, he's uh, experienced, but, uh, you know, he just uh, keeps on working at it. A um, little bit like Cat Evans uh, in the same situation, just one of those riders who can just uh, every day uh, keep working at it and... Uh, you know, walk the other ones down over time, and uh, Scarponi is uh, in that uh, in that bracket of riders. Uh, it's it's going to be an interesting one for the general classification. Um, the overall victory now it looks like uh, you know nobody can really challenge uh, Vincent Nibali, but uh, the other places, the places for the podium, second and third in the podium is all to play for, and uh, that's where Scarponi, uh, Rigoberto Turan. Um, and the other ones, um, you know, are going to be fighting. And they, 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 they've seen that Cat Evans is suffering a bit in the time trial. He didn't have a good day. He's seen him getting weak at the end of this race. He's starting to suffer fatigue. And, you know, they will be trying to, you know, push him and uh, get on to that second place. Uran, certainly, and Scarborn, they will be all trying to get on up on the second and third places on the podium. I've had a good few questions in the last, uh, in the last few weeks about your book, Sean. How's the, uh, how are the preparations for that coming along? Well, the book is... Uh, it's, uh, Have you finished your homework? All ready to go. The homework has done it a long time. Um, so I think, yes, it will be uh, sometime in the middle of the month uh, the book will be launched around the, um, I would say, the 10th or 15th of this month. So well in time for the for the tour? Yes, 15th, 10th or 15th of June, sorry. Any good stories in there you can tell us? Well, yes, uh, I, I'm telling it all in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, yes, there is a lot of stories, you know, there's... Uh, it's amazing, this, you know, the things that happen in bike racing, and you know, you can, uh, uh, y you can, you know, just uh, give people a bit of more insight into a career. And um, has it all come flooding back for you? Well, you know, as you go through the years, of course, when you, you know, start uh, going through race by race, a lot of things come back to you. And uh, uh, you know, there were some uh, some great days in there, not in the racing itself, because we all know about the racing and what happened in races and how they went. But outside of the races, there was, you know, some real funny moments forward to reading that uh, in early June ahead of the Tour de France in plenty of time lots of the uh, tweets coming in of course in relation to uh, Tour de France David Harmon will be back in the hot seat for that uh, at the uh, beginning of July Brunico as the uh, riders hit the 50 miles to go point just under six minutes advantage so the uh, four riders up front did gain a few seconds advantage as a result of the uh, 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 the, the peloton working their way through the feed zone Those four riders are fighting desperately to hang on to what they've got because the Uskeltels, for whatever reason, are on the front and pushing hard. And there's always intrigue when, uh, when bike racing is involved and particularly when they're racing in Italy. So now Lamprey... Uh, in the form of Niemitz. Bettencourt making an appearance on the front of the peloton as well. 
Oh, interesting uh, appearance of uh, Niemitz and uh, Betancourt. Betancourt perhaps uh, just tracking him. He's, uh, they're obviously not too far apart on general classification. Just keeping tabs on him to see is he interested in doing anything or maybe just uh, went up for a bit of a chat. There is uh, Carlos Betancourt just two seconds behind Rafael Maike in the young rider classification. Nemitz is uh, sitting six minutes and nine seconds off uh, Vincenzo Nibli. Rafael Maike is 6.45 and uh, Carlos Betancourt 6.47. Uh, so 38 seconds just between Nemitz and, and uh, Carlos Betancourt on general classification. Those riders just peeking their heads uh, out the front of the bunch just to see what, uh, what the wind is like up there. And the Coronas. Of course, in uh, 2006, uh, what would have been the Giro's first visit to uh, Plan de Coronas, they had to cancel that one due to snow. So, snow cancellations in the uh, Giro, far from unusual. They did manage to run the stage, of course. Uh, on that occasion, they went to uh, finish it below Paso Fortia. Okay, just under seven minutes advantage, six three quarters minutes advantage for these four riders up front still toiling away in what is sunshine at the moment. Stage 20 of the Giro d'Italia from Cilandro to Trecime de Lavaredo. Trains are running on time, so two are the riders. They're pushing hard uh, towards that uh, rendezvous at the top of the highest point of this year's Giro d'Italia. Up at uh, Lavaredo, it has been snowing hard day after day, but uh, in the valley below, while well, the riders in uh, relatively balmy weather, by, in comparison with what they've had, Rigoberto Uran, third overall, four minutes and 12 seconds down. It was uh, an average time trial performance for uh, Uran. Well, he would have been uh, reasonably satisfied, I think, with uh, with what he came up. What I'm saying, I mean, sixth actually is pretty good for Uran. Was a hilly time trial. And as a general classification contender, he might have hoped for more, but he limited his losses reasonably well and did, of course, close on Cadet Evans. So uh, he will have been satisfied with that. And Uran is being... Uh, brought safely back into the uh, the embrace of the peloton after a visit back to the cars four riders out front have that seven minutes advantage Jaro Ermetti of Androni Giocattoli Venezuela Pavel Brut of uh, Katusha Adam Hansen of Lotto Belisol and Yaroslav Popovic of the Radio Shack squad best placed overall is uh, Adam Hansen 75th overall over two hours behind And on the front, as they have been for so much of the afternoon, and to uh, very few people's uh, clear understanding, is the Uscaltel squad. Vinny Fantini have been in the news for all the wrong reasons over the last couple of days as a result of uh, Danilo De Luca's positive and his disappearance uh, ignominiously from the race. Here's a former winner, Stefano Garzelli, the oldest man in this race, 39 years of age now. Himself and uh, Danilo Honda still showing extraordinary uh, motivation and enthusiasm for the sport of professional cycling at that age and doing a solid job. Garzelli's uh, teammate uh, Maro Santambrogio has been one of the surprises of the race and he's uh, eighth overall. I think I might have said he was sixth a uh, little bit earlier, but he's eighth overall. And uh, while he has uh, struggled in the time trials and uh, has struggled a bit in the last week in general, it has been a, a very positive performance for him. Yes, uh, in the time trial he struggled, but again, I think, uh, you know, the, um, the end of a, a three-week race, um, the time trial is where you're going to uh, get caught out. If you're not a really good time trialist, you're a little bit um, uh, starting to get uh, tired at the end of the race, well then you can lose quite a lot of time, and uh, Sant'Ambrogio did lose 
uh, a bit of time in the role stage uh, uh, leading up to the time trial, then the time trial as well, although his time trial wouldn't be his strong point. A mountain time trial, he should be in OK because he's a good climber, so I think he's uh, starting to suffer. And maybe he's happy that the weather race is going, that they're not doing the big mountains because uh, if you're really starting to feel the pain and the suffering, well, you could lose more time. And at the moment, he's still in there on eighth. And he could be saying himself at this moment but if we had the two big mountain stage yesterday and today I would have been in difficulty and I would probably have lost my place in the top ten yeah which matters a lot to riders on that uh, board at the finish of the stage get their name in lights and they'll fight hard for that one Tell, is it for uh, Samuel Sanchez or is it for some other reason that they're chasing at the moment uh, gap now steadily has, well, it's extended out to uh, seven minutes. So a bit of a stall has gone on. There's been a lot of uh, chatting in the peloton. Someone was on Twitter earlier asking uh, what exactly did they talk about. Everything under the sun when things are uh, easy, but uh, when things are hard and they have an opportunity for a few sentences, it tends to be mostly about the race action and exactly uh, what their expectations might be for the riders around them. Yes, and um, you know, when it's going a little bit slower um, at the moment, uh, it's pushing on a bit too much for comfort there, and everybody is, you know, uh, giving it a big effort to stay up the front and to stay in the peloton. We have seen uh, on a number of occasions where the, you know, the, the peloton is really stretched out, and that tells the pace is, you know, very fast at the moment. And Escatel, you know, they're doing an amazing job here, and uh, the guys out front are four leaders. They're really pushing on the breakaway, um, and I think it's the, uh, it's a bit of a ding down between the uh, breakaway now to see can they hold off the Escatel uh, team and uh, if uh, Escatel come off the front it will be interesting then to see if somebody else will take it up or will the four royals out front be allowed to pull out an advantage and um, I could see at a point where Escatel is going to say well we're not going to be able to close this one down um, because they have been on the front now for you know two hours at least and uh, the advantage they did pull it down a bit and then is that they're growing out again so I feel that they're uh, starting to suffer here and the four out front are proven to be the strongest. But back in the peloton, there's a lot of teams and a lot of riders that think maybe thinking of getting a stage victory here. So if they take it up, well, then that is going to be the real killer for the four-man breakaway in front. Any question that Iskaltel have, uh, have an arrangement with another team? Perhaps they're, they're giving them a dig out? I don't see where the arrangement could be coming from because if you look at the general classification um, there's certainly nothing there because Nibali he doesn't need any uh, team to give him a help and it would not be the first time we've seen that but uh, the situation he has you know, the Astana team around him here the breakaway there's no danger whatsoever as we said you know, two hours and three minutes to Adam Hansen from the Lotho by the Sol team is the best in general classification so uh, there's no reason to you know be concerned at all about that and the the other, uh, the other uh, um, classmates, I don't see where they could be, you know, working for some team there. It's just that uh, we see the discussion going on there a number of times, and uh, I'm still looking at classmates uh, here, but uh, I can't see any reason for uh, in any of the classmates where they should be riding. So it looks like there's some bit of a rivalry. I reckon we will hear more about that hopefully before the stage end, if not for tomorrow's. Slamo of the man in Malirosa as he has been since stage eight. Vincenzo Nibli, the shark of Messina. He's a long way from Sicily here. Did most of his uh, early racing course in Tuscany. He moved, over, he moved up as a teenager to get the best racing that he possibly could. Snow has abated. Still the uh, banks of snow on either side of the road. If you want to know how hard the, uh, these, these climbs really are, then uh, watch the amateurs making their way up. The tourists uh, making their way up to the finish. Well, they really are incredibly arduous indeed. And these uh, pros sometimes make it look so easy. We think, uh, well, it's an easy sport, really. Actually, question, one question. They well, a couple of questions. Uh, one, uh, what's Sean's book called? Another one, uh, what are the best and uh, worst things about being a professional cyclist, Sean? Well, the worst things about a professional cyclist is when you get the weather conditions, um, which we've seen in this uh, race uh, so many days, you know, the snow, cold conditions, uh, that is very difficult um, in a stage race. When you get it in the classic races, you have one race, one day, 
a big classic but then you can have a number of days to recover uh, but when you have to go out day after day in the cold conditions the wet conditions that is really you know energy sapping and uh, it's also difficult for the morale of the riders um, you know these riders they don't like the rain but when it's real cold um, you know down zero degrees two degrees it's so cold on the bike when you get wet and uh, uh, everybody just hates uh, those uh, those type of conditions and the best bit the money well the best bit when you get on the podium with the um, with the, uh, the 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 girls that present the bouquet and present <laughs> the uh, bottle of champagne that is the that is a good part of it certainly but no when you have a result and you know you prepare for many years uh, to get uh, to a level where you can compete in the discipline that you're really good at if it's the classics if it's a t- if it's a grand tour if it's time trialing and then you you succeed and you win those events uh, you know that gives you an enormous amount of pleasure and after all the hard work i think uh, you know that is so satisfying and uh, there's a lot of riders like work for so many years and um, eventually they get to it after maybe five seven years of working at it very very hard and i think uh, that gives an enormous amount of self-pleasure and and some well not every ex-pro but you've been lucky in that you still like cycling yes i think um, a lot of the riders when they retire in the past you know they had so many years of biking and i suppose you know difficult times um you know they got away from biking they had a little bit of you know a head full of it and um, uh, for a number of years didn't touch the bike at all i continued on i enjoyed it you know riding the bike at a more leisurely pace of course when you come from the professionals and then you start you know riding for leisure i enjoyed it all the time and i continued and i still do but a lot of the professionals that stop for five years seven years they come back most of them come back later and get into biking and you know continue on biking for a long time into the late ages yeah it is a, it is a sport for life it's uh, tougher in some of the uh, the big contact team sports where uh, where competitors can be uh, badly damaged of course and it is tough to play that uh, later and later but uh, cycling well it is a sport for life and as long as you can avoid falling off too often uh, then you can avoid injury Plenty of uh, opportunities to divert yourself at the finish line, and the uh, riders out on the course are getting the food in. Tirongo is uh, hungry, as you might imagine. Oh, and uh, that answers another question as well. I'm trying to remember the name, Signy. Uh, Sean's book is called Hunger. Hunger coming out in early June. Okay, just under seven minutes for the four riders uh, up front. We'll take this opportunity for another short break. You're very welcome back to stage 20 of the Giro d'Italia. It's the penultimate day of racing as the riders make their way from Cilandro to Trecime de Lavaredo in the Dolomite Mountains. Racing through the valley for much of the day, having uh, the organizers having had to remove the passes of Costalunga, San Pellegrino and Giao. But nonetheless, we have a very, very testing and demanding finish. And indeed, while well, the riders have been climbing for about the last 20 odd kilometers or more, it's, uh, it's difficult to uh, to say just how long this uh, this particular climb, the uh, Chimbanque, goes on. It's uh, it's a steady rise rather than uh, than a leg breaking climb in the traditional sense. But I can assure you, this is a really, really tough and demanding one. And the Uscaltels remain on the front for reasons unknown exactly. Samuel Sanchez, of course, will be very much looking forward to the opportunity perhaps to uh, score their uh, first stage win of the race. Stage victories, of course, the most successful squad, uh, the Movistar team and indeed the uh, Amiga Pharma Quickstep team. Most successful single rider in terms of stage success, of course, is uh, Mark Cavendish. And uh, the Movistar team have taken four wins through uh, two for Giovanni Visconti. One for Benyat in Shousti, and one, of course, for uh, the aforementioned uh, Alex Dowsett, mentioned earlier in the programme. At length, he took the stage eight success from uh, Gabice Mare to Saltara, ahead of uh, the Olympic champion Bradley Wiggins. Tanel Kangert was uh, third on that occasion. So they've been the, uh, the two most successful squads in terms of stage success. In terms of uh, overall success, it looks like it's going the way of Astana. Vincenzo Nibali has held the pink jersey every day since that uh, Stage 8 time trial.
This is 12th day in succession wearing the Maya Rosa. Fourteen. Yeah. Because yesterday was the day where he held the jersey. <laughs> Did he wear it? If yes. I, yeah. If I was a rider, I would be claiming yesterday also. That although the stage was cancelled, uh, he was still the holder of the yellow jersey on that day. Hey, you wore the yellow jersey on a rest day, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Tour de France. <laughs> Did you wear it on the day? Uh, I slept on it that night, actually. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, fair play. It's not every day you get the opportunity to have a yellow jersey in the Tour of France, so you would make as much time in it as possible. And do you still have that jersey? No, um, actually at the end of the Tour of France my car got broken into outside the hotel and uh, the yellow jersey that I uh, had on that day in the mountains uh, it got stolen from the car. But the organisers did present me another jersey, but um, of course I haven't got the actual jersey that I wore on the stage when I was the race leader. Yeah, oh, that's so disappointing. I wonder where that is now. Did they realise what they had? Six and three quarter minutes, uh, the advantage for the uh, four leaders up front. Let's go through them again. Giaro Armetti of Androni Giacattoli, 154th overall at uh, three hours, 28 minutes and 46 seconds. So uh, clearly not a factor overall. He's uh, 32 years of age. The Italian Pavel Brut of uh, Katusha. Adam Hansen, the Australian with the Lotto Belisol squad. And uh, Yaroslav Popovich of Radio Shack. And tweets coming in at DQ Sport. What's Sean's favourite Grand Tour to ride and to watch? Well, I think um, the one to ride is the Tour of France as a rider. Uh, the Tour of France is a one which everybody uh, in your early days as a cyclist, when you start off as a kid, 15, 16 year old, um, you know, you get into biking and then immediately, of course, you think about riding the Tour de France one day. Uh, so it is, um, it is the one when you get to uh, ride on your first uh, appearance. You know, it's, a, uh, it's a special moment, a special time. And uh, I would say of all my tours, yes, the Tour of France um, would be the one which I would, uh, I would remember most and the, the, some of the ones that I uh, enjoyed most as well. Um, but, you know, the years differ as well. And some years you have a really good race and you get through the race without any problems. And uh, look is a big thing in cycling as well. A bit of look uh, on your side, it helps so much. You can, you know, avoid crashes and uh, be in the right place at the, at the moment. And uh, uh, those years, I think you say, well, you know, that was a real good year for me. And then, you know, you go back another year, the form is not as good. You suffer a lot as it is in the big mountain stage as well. So many people ask the question, well, what is your favourite climb? I don't have a favourite climb uh, because one year, you know, you get through a big mountain very well. The following year, you go back for some reason, you're suffering at that uh, point in the race and you really suffer. So, uh, you know, it just differs over, over the years and each year it can be totally different. So, calling the holes and the uh, little bits of street furniture. As uh, AG Tour Le Mondial I'll go up to uh, perhaps give Bruce Galtel team a little bit of a dig out. Got a quick uh, shot of Rafael Andreato of uh, the Vini Fantini squad, the uh, Brazilian rider. He's leading the uh, Premio Italia Fuga Pinarello classification. He's uh, spent the most amount of time in the uh, particular way that they work out uh, long breaks. Hasn't been in the uh, long breaks all day and all night, but uh, he has the lead in that competition. It's a very, very uh, for the arcane set of rules. Uh, he doesn't get a jersey for it, of course, but uh, he does. Uh, there is money for it, and uh, he will have an opportunity to celebrate uh, victory in a classification at the conclusion of this uh, Giro d'Italia, unless uh, one of these riders out front manages to edge clear. But the uh, the men second and third in that classification are Emanuele Sella and Androni, of Androni Giacattoli and uh, Pim Lichtart of the Vacancelet team. Talking about disappointments, actually, the Vacancelet team haven't really had... Uh, had the Giro that they would have liked. Haven't been able to come up with the stage victory. They've had a few appearances in uh, breakaways, but a little bit more disappointing. Rafael Andriato is uh, second also in the sprints competition, and that uh, actually he must. He, what am I saying? He must be leading it. Maxime Belkov was uh, was leading that, but Belkov non-starter today as a result of being over the time limit. So uh, Andriato heading towards victory in uh, two competitions, potentially with 
mind you, Cameron Wharf, who was in the break the first day, first day back in uh, Naples from the Cannondale team. He's uh, just two points behind, so if he manages to get in the break tomorrow or they manage to uh, reel these guys in in time for the, uh, the first sprint, which looks unlikely at this point, then you'd never know there could be a little bit of a scrap between Andreato and Wharf. Other classifications, the uh, Sky uh, team lead the team classification on time, which is the more important of the two. There was a question in about that earlier. The points, uh, the team points competition, well, it is a classification. It's something to be won, but it's the, the one on time in uh, general classification that is, is definitely the more important of the two. Sky lead that by 5 minutes and 49 seconds uh, from Blanco. Movie star in third, 7.01 in arrears. The most combative uh, award... And that's uh, currently being led by Giovanni Visconti of the Movistar team. 39 points ahead of uh, Stefano Pirazzi and uh, Mark Cavendish uh, third in the point standings of that. And Pirazzi, I think, has been... Uh, we've, we've spoken about Visconti, so let's uh, let's give a cheer for uh, Pirazzi. Leading the mountains competition, really only needs to uh, stand up to win that one at this point. Has a very handy advantage over Visconti, so unless something extraordinary happens... Uh, on these two final classified climbs of the Giro d'Italia, he'll have that one uh, secured. And Pirazzi, we saw him at the back of the bunch where he tends to stay unless there's uh, an opportunity to get up front and out and into the break. Has, uh, has been very, very active through this race and has given us lots of entertainment. At Cycling Mole wants to know when are the two uh, intermediate sprint points. Um, 54 kilometres to go according to my roadbook, uh, revised roadbook. And 22.1 uh, kilometres to go. First one is uh, definitely an opportunity for Mark Cavendish to uh, to score a couple of points. Might, uh, might be able to last for the second one too, or would that be a bridge too far, do you think, for Cavendish, uh, Sean? No, I think he's capable of getting it up up um, up to the second one um, at Cortina. Um, you know, it uh, it goes up uh, very gradually all the time, and then there's a, little, uh, a downhill for about 10k to the sprint at the just around the just around the 22 kilometres to go to the finish. And uh, you know, he could uh, he, he could stay in there um, if it continues on. Uh, as it has been for a long, long time in this stage, then you know it's uh, it's a strong pace, but um, um, you know he can I, th I think hang in there and get uh, also in the second intermediate sprint get some points from it. Well, that one comes just at the start of the trek Rochi, but uh, but before it uh, really gets going, so yeah, could have a chance there. Two classified climbs. Uh, the trek Rochi is a category two climb, so nine points on offer at the at the top of that. Just under 8 kilometres, as I said, 7.5% average, maximum of 12%. It starts with 22.1 uh, kilometres to go, finishes uh, just a smidge over 14 to go. Delta Bravo wants to know, should Cadell go hard and try to guarantee second or save himself for the Tour de France, giving the, given the Giro is a tour warm-up for him? Is it, well, he kind of, you know, since the time trial, he's been saying, well, you know, it's with good training. He's, like, done little tweets with hashtag good training and things like that after his, his uh, difficult day before the time trial as well. So I think that's been slightly disingenuous. It's become good training, but it was a goal. When he started the race and when he found himself right up there uh, towards the front, Evans definitely wanted to try and win the race if he could. Uh, now I think he's uh, got more... Uh, He's had, to, he's had his ambitions tempered a little bit and he just has to consider it good training. And uh, given that Jim Okowitz has said that, uh, yeah, absolutely, we'll, we'll have him as a protected rider for the Tour de France, uh, then then for, for Evans, yes, this has been a, a worthwhile exercise, but it's been ultimately a little bit disappointing. Having said that, a, a, a podium finish in a Grand Tour is very, very important for a rider's palmares. So, uh, yeah, he'll absolutely ride to protect that second place. question is, would he... Would he risk a stage victory, you know, against the possibility of losing second place? You know, would second or third make much difference to him? And would he, would he, you know, perhaps strike out early on the climb to try and go for, uh, go for glory? No, I think he will be thinking of um, the place on the podium. That's certainly going to be the um, uh, the most important thing in his mind. And uh, if you go for a stage victory, you make the calculation. You're going for the stage victory. In that, you're also improving on your general classification your place at the podium 
Uh, so it's a little bit of both. You can play both cars very well together, and that's what he's going to be doing at the end of the stage. If he's got, uh, if he's got the energy to do that, and uh, that's something we'll wait and see. But uh, you know, a stage victory would be. Uh, it would be a nice one to come away to a big two or a stage victory and get on the podium if you get second place behind uh, Nibali for example who has been you know, so good in this race it would be a real good uh, Giro Italia for Cat 11s Havel Brute up there in the break 6 minutes and 20 seconds to the good uh, of course took a stage victory in uh, Giro Italia back in 2008 Led in Johannes uh, Frulinger of the uh, Gerald Steiner team on that occasion. So he knows what it's like to uh, taste victory in the Giro. That'll be a bit of an ask for him to uh, come up with the result today. Having said that, they've got a decent advantage as they head towards the back end. And now a uh, little bit of help and encouragement from the Columbia squad. Duque of Colombia. Duque, their, their uh, sprinter, their best base rider, 20th overall, Adapuma. Adapuma is uh, 25 minutes and 58 seconds behind, so he's uh, not by any uh, stretch a threat to the uh, the top 10 classification contenders. So could well be a man to look for for uh, stage honours today. We'll see what uh, starts to happen. Things are going to kick off relatively soon I think as we get closer and closer to these final hills so four riders up front uh, Ermetti Brut of uh, Katusha Adam Hansen is on the front uh, for Lotto Belisol Yaroslav uh, Popovic sitting there as well for the Radio Shack squad so 61 kilometers to go just over six minutes advantage for those four riders rejoin us for the uh, next part after these